Uh, the Bone Sparrow is a story of a refugee boy who is born in a detention centre uh, and the world inside the fences is the only one he knows. The particular um, event was reading the article about uh, this, this woman who, uh, she was a Tamil refugee and she'd been living in the community with her two children and then one day she was called into the immigration department for a meeting which sort of happened quite regularly. So she brought her kids in and there she was told that she received an adverse risk assessment from ACO and they were immediately placed back in a detention centre. Um, and two days later she found out that she was pregnant with her third child. So most of the research I did um, was on, online, on the internet. I looked, um, there, there's quite a lot of stuff published, um, both media reports and photos and documentaries about detention centres, both onshore and offshore. Um, and so I, I um, immersed myself in, in those articles and in those documentaries until I really got a sense of, of the place. Uh, I didn't want to go to a detention centre, partly because um, I, I still want it to be a fictionalised place and I, I knew as soon as I'd seen it I wouldn't be able to get that the realness of it out of my head to invent this place. So Subi is a nine-year-old boy. Uh, he spent his whole life in the detention centre. Uh, his family are Rohingya refugees. Um, but Subi's a, he's a pretty optimistic person and he's, he's full of hope and finds joy in sort of the bleakest of places. And he's got an incredibly strong imagination and a belief that someday his world will be a different place. Um, Jimmy is uh, a girl who lives in a, in a nearby community. It's a remote rural community. Uh, her mother has died and her father is struggling to cope with uh, the mother's death and raising two kids on his own. Um, like many kids in remote Australian communities, Jimmy doesn't attend school regularly, so although she's 10, she can't read. Uh, and she has two uh, I suppose, um, memories of her mother that she carries with her and one of them is a, um, a sparrow pendant which she wears around her neck, which is the bone sparrow, and the other is her mother's notebook in which she wrote down the stories of the bone sparrow and Jimmy's desperate to hear the stories again and hear her mother's voice in her words. Uh, without a doubt Eli, there's a scene towards the end of the book where Eli features strongly and even going through the final edit I had to struggle with my willpower to make sure I didn't rewrite that whole scene so that things turned out differently for Eli. So for me, he's definitely the one that was most meaningful. I, um, I knew I wanted a talisman of some sort and the image that came to mind was a, a bird. Um, I guess they're sort of iconic symbol of freedom and hope. Uh, and also they're migratory animals, so they fly across borders to find safety. Um, and I like the symbolism in that. So I started researching birds uh, and there's the symbolism behind them and I came across a belief about sparrows, that sparrows carry the souls of dead people. And I already had the storyline running through about um, the bone sparrow pendant carrying the uh, souls of Jimmy's family. Uh, so it seemed to be a perfect fit. Yeah, unfortunately not. Um, it's just completely made up. I guess it's a traditional cultural story in the sense that uh, it's a story about love and fate bring people together. So in that sense, a general cultural story it is, but I don't know. No. Yeah, it's funny, people keep asking me about the pebble of happy and it was quite a small thing when I was writing it, but um, I have three children and whenever we go out walking, invariably uh, we end up with rocks in pockets of everyone. Um, they pick them up, they collect them, they pour over them. Uh, and I was thinking of the kind of activity which could be done inside a detention centre as well as outside, and so collecting rocks and pebbles came to mind. Uh, and the idea of imbuing the pebbles and rocks with sort of hopes and dreams um, came to me because when I was pregnant with my second son, I did a technique called hypnobirthing, which is basically a way of meditating and relaxing your body. And one of the techniques is that you squeeze your fingers and thumb together very tightly and you imagine a happy scene. 
So you imagine everything about it, the smells, the sights, the sounds, and you keep practicing doing this. And so then what happens, it's very effective, that then whenever you squeeze your fingers together, you, you're sort of flooded with happy feelings. Um, and so I thought that'd be nice for someone to teach Subi that technique. Uh, I'm appalled and horrified and ashamed at the way Australia treats asylum seekers, but it's not just an Australian issue. Uh, the treatment of asylum seekers is, has reached a crisis point worldwide and I don't think any country, or certainly not many countries, have got it right. Um, so although the description of the camp and the treatment of the refugees and asylum seekers within the camp was based on those in Australian detention centres, I think they're very similar to refugee camps and detention centres worldwide. Uh, I mean, if you look at the jungle in Calais, for example, um, it's, the conditions there are pretty similar to what I've described in the book.